Hi there, and welcome to Pippi Polemics. We're a group of friends who regularly discuss topics at the intersection of faith, intellect, and society. My name is James Liang. I'm a part-time seminary student who's interested in philosophy, theology, and apologetics. In this channel, I'm going to summarize books I'm reading at the moment and provide my preliminary thoughts on them. My hope is to get interested listeners up to speed on the topics we discuss and provide a forum for sharing and discussing our thoughts. This is the first video in a chapter-by-chapter -chapter series on Brian Davies' book, The Thought of Thomas Aquinas. I'm reading this book as part of a systematic theology class I'm taking on theology proper and creation, and I thought it'd be a good idea to do a video series on this book because Thomistic philosophy often goes unmentioned in today's popular apologetic scene, and I think it deserves a seat at the table. Having learned most of my theology and apologetics from Protestant analytic philosophers like William Lane Craig, I had no idea there was this whole other system of thought out there that has this totally different view of God, and that's widely held by Catholic thinkers. Since Thomism is a very old system that builds on Aristotle's metaphysics, it sounds extremely foreign to modern ears and takes a while to grasp. I personally found this book extremely accessible and helpful for understanding Thomism, and so I hope this video series will help you gain a better understanding of it too. In this video, I'll be summarizing the first chapter of the book, The Shape of a Saint, which is a short biography of Thomas Aquinas' life. Apparently there's some scholarly debate as to when he was born, but the range is between 1224 and 1226. He was born to a baron named Landolf de Kino, who served under Emperor Frederick II, and his wife Theodora, in the Kingdom of Naples at the southern part of the Italian peninsula. At the age of five, he was sent to the Abbey of Monte Cassino to receive his education, and moved to the University of Naples when he was a teenager after the abbey was occupied by imperial troops. It was at Naples that Aquinas studied the full range of Aristotle's works, and came to regard him as the paradigm of sound reason, assigning him the moniker of the philosopher. It was also at Naples that he befriended the Dominican Order of Friars who appealed to him because they were committed to studying, teaching, and preaching rather than individual contemplation as characterized by traditional monastic orders, and he joined them in 1242 or 1243. He was sent by his superiors from Naples to Rome and then to Paris, but his parents objected to his involvement with the Dominicans and detained him at home for two years. Eventually, he was able to rejoin his brethren in 1246 and was sent to Paris, where he transcribed lectures for his mentor, Albert the Great. Albert and others were impressed with Thomas's intellect, leading to his teaching assignment at the University of Paris. He started out as an apprentice philosopher lecturing on scripture, then a commentator for the sentences of Peter Lombard, an official university textbook for theological instruction, and then finally a professor of theology in 1256. From then to 1259, he lectured on the Bible and led discussions on debates surrounding truth, providence, grace, freedom, and prophecy, resulting in a series of works known as the Disputed Questions. He also wrote Bible commentaries, commentaries on Aristotle, and polemical tracts, as well as his two most famous works, large treatises called the Summa Contra Gentiles, which argued against religious views contrary to the Catholic faith, and the Summa Theologiae, a comprehensive treatment of a wide range of theological topics that was left unfinished prior to his death. He continued teaching at various universities until 1273, when he became seriously ill and suffered a physical and mental breakdown, possibly due to overwork. On his way to attend the Second Council of Lyons in 1273, he became ill and asked to be carried to an abbey to die. He died in March of 1274 at the Cistercian Abbey in Fossanova, south of Rome. His remains currently lie in the Church of the Jacobins in Toulouse, France. After going through the details of Aquinas' life, Davies then enters into a discussion of Aquinas' character. His first discussion is whether Aquinas was more of a philosopher or a theologian. He concludes that he was probably more of a theologian, as his philosophy was done in the context of theology. Additionally, he didn't elevate reason above revelation and believed that Christian doctrine was to be arrived at through a long study of scripture, not rational arguments. On the other hand, Aquinas also can be rightly called a philosopher, as he treated reason as a science, reason based on data, and argued in a way that anyone could understand and accept. Then Davies discusses Aquinas as a saint and a thinker. He says that Aquinas lived a life devoted to prayer, poverty, chastity, and obedience. He was extremely inquisitive and constantly thirsted for knowledge of God, wanting to explore the divine in as many ways as possible. 
He was also dedicated to communicating his ideas, sacrificing prose and literary excellence for clarity. Finally, he was very open-minded, quoting many sources and not accepting anything anyone said on the basis of their authority alone, but on the merit of their argument. Davies concludes the chapter by offering different views of how Aquinas is viewed today. The Catholic Church has revered him for centuries and made his thought central to their teaching. However, other readers are unimpressed with him for his lackluster writing, his dated opinions, his neglect of philosophical questions that interest modern readers, and his dogmatism regarding his Catholic faith. Nonetheless, he's important to study because he had a lot of interesting things to say about perennial topics, especially with regards to philosophical theology. Since this chapter is just a summary of who Aquinas was, I don't have anything to say by way of analysis. I'd just like to make the observation that this was clearly a man who was devoted to God and who loved him with all his mind. He worked tirelessly, wrote prolifically, and taught with the conscious intention of training the next generations of Christians, revealing a deep personal commitment not just to God, but also to the church as a whole. These are virtues that I think every Christian ought to admire and try their best to emulate. Next time, I'll be summarizing chapter 2 of Davies' book, Getting to God, which focuses on Aquinas' arguments for God's existence, the famous five ways. I hope you enjoyed this video. If this has been helpful to you, please help us out and like, share, and subscribe. Also make sure to hit that bell button for notifications. If you think I'm onto something, or you think I'm dead wrong, please feel free to drop a comment down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. With that, I'll see you in the next video.